Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome uh, both in the class, a good attendance here, and, and for Zoom. There's plenty of people from Zoom, and some people, I think, coming the first time, so double welcome for you. Um, we have a very exciting talk tonight, and it's going to be a double act with no slides, but it should still be very animated, with uh, Jerome Lewis, who's going to speak first, and Chris Knight. And they've been working now, woo, 15 years years or more, almost two decades or, together on the subject, going back to Cradle of Language and Stellenbosch, um, on the subject of origin of language. Um, and Chris turned to the origin of language. Well, we heard from him a, a week or so ago on decoding Chomsky, but he wanted to address the evolutionary emergence of language um, and started up a whole series of conferences. He's probably going to tell you about Eva Lang in the 90s, he was one of the founders of these conferences um, and tackling this problem from a sort of theoretical position. And when we got to know Jerome and his incredible field work with the Bayaka um, for many long years, the Bayaka Benjele, and Jerome had all these ideas from the forest with a, with a practical kind of instruction of the Benjele hunter-gatherers about what language was and, and um, how, you know, what they could teach us about how language evolved. So I'm going to hand over to Jerome. Jerome's, of course, assistant professor here at UCL, and Chris is research fellow, Henri, I, I don't know, senior research associate at UCL, something like that. That's research getting on a bit, the <laughs> Here you go. So you can check that on the Okay, well, thanks. <coughs> Sorry. Thanks very much, Camilla. And uh, lovely to see you all here. Um, so the origin of language was something that I had no intention of uh, getting involved in when I began my field work. And it wasn't something that occurred to me as being particularly possible to answer. In fact, in 1865, the Linguistic Society of Paris banned all discussion on the origin of language. Because every time someone came with a new theory, they'd end up getting in such big arguments with the uh, people who had other theories that it would often end up in fights and uh, and so they just decided to ban it completely and uh, and then for you know 120 odd years until 1990s it was a taboo subject nobody would discuss the origin of language and given how much human beings think of themselves as being these extraordinary speaking animals it really does seem astonishing that we have uh, left this really important subject uh, the, the difference that we have with other animals of being able to speak um, really is quite a remarkable thing. So, uh, as I said, I, I hadn't really thought about it uh, until Chris invited me to come and give a talk at a conference in, in Stellenbosch, South Africa. And in fact, the Radical Anthropology Group at the time gave me a little stipend to help me get there because I was a, a, a still an impoverished student at the time. And... Uh, and so what I did was I just presented the range of different ways that Mbambenjeli people uh, use to communicate and engage, not just with each other, but with the whole forest around them. And uh, it's quite important, I guess, just to, to qualify this. I'm not saying Mbambenjeli people are primitive or uh, somehow fossils stuck in some past way of being. Quite the contrary. I, they are extremely... Uh, sophisticated modern people and <coughs> what they have is they've developed through their long dwelling in this forest a series of ways of being and communicating and engaging with the other creatures the other beings in that forest which are extremely sophisticated um, and, uh, and these are very modern solutions because they work really well in today's forest uh, as they have done in past forests and so what they do is they show us particular solutions to the question of communication and how to do it, which are really quite mind-opening uh, for uh, people like us who are brought up in literate cultures where the word has a special uh, power uh, as a grammatical uh, dictionary-defined set of propositions which we all agree upon or at least think we agree upon um, most of the time. Uh, their language is something which extends well beyond the human, so that the Bambangeli have developed all sorts of techniques for not just communicating with specific animals, particularly those animals they wish to have social relationships with. Um, it's not only the animals they hunt, but it is often animals that they hunt. 
so they have all sorts of ways of calling animals to them because in the forest you can't see very far the uh, undergrowth the canopy uh, all make it very difficult to see more than just a few meters around you so in fact uh, a sight is not a really effective mode for knowing your environment. What you need to do is to be able to listen. And as the Benjeli walked through the forest, uh, I remember the first time I was taken hunting, rather than <coughs> you know, moving around and looking for signs and tracks and traces and seeing, we sat down after about 45 minutes, we sat down on a, a small little hillock of a, a, an ancient tree that had died, uh, and just it seemed like everyone was snoozing. Uh, and I was really puzzled. I thought this wasn't how I imagined hunting to be. But of course, what people were doing was they were listening because that's actually how you find out what's around you. And then after, I can't remember, 20 or so minutes, someone said, ah, we heard a ooh. And that was a pig grunting somewhere off in the distance. And so everyone just really listened carefully. And then we heard another ooh, ooh, ah. Oh, there are these particular trees over in this part of the forest that are fruiting right now. Those must be where the pigs are. So if we go this way, we'll get to in front of them and then we'll have a chance of perhaps encountering them. And of course, it's all about conjunctions. It's all about being together in the same place as those animals, which is crucial for hunting. So this opened me up to a whole set of different ways of communicating that uh, include also, of course, music and dance. Because when the Bambangelis sing and, and perform their, their rituals, when they, they sing polyphonically, it's a particular style of singing which is overlapping oh, melodies. Oh, overlapping melodies. Can you mute here, please? Thanks. Overlapping melodies, each individual singing a different melody. And when they overlap uh, and they're performed in really tight synchrony, they create a new song which sort of rises and plays over the top of the individual melodies that they're singing. And, uh, and, and that new song is a little bit like what happens when you walk in the forest and you're listening to uh, the monkey over here go or whatever it is, and the little bird go and then uh, 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 a cicada rubbing its arms on its and that is a really it's a brain uh, jarring sound. Um, but all those different sounds coming from the different animals are rather like a polyphony, a polyphony, they are a polyphony of course, and, and the overall sound of the forest is like the polyphonic song, it is the song of the forest. And so when humans return their, uh, 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 that th when they want to speak to the forest, to ask the forest for abundance, uh, they turn their speech into a song and they make it a polyphonic song as a human way of articulating that forest language. If you want to speak to dikers, you go meow, meow. And then dikers think, oh, oh, it's time to play. They're a small antelope. And they come running out to see who's, who's there to play, who's there to play. Uh, and of course, it's not such a happy story. But um, <coughs> so what, what the Benjali have done is they've realized that through mimicry, through imitating very precisely the sounds of other beings, you are able to engage in communicative exchanges with them. And so the paper that I gave at this conference in Stellenbosch was called As Well As Words as a way of trying to remind the linguists that actually just the words that we focus on as being these uh, uh, you know, really important things about language are just part of the story. And there's a whole other element to it. Gesture, of course, is key, uh, and, and, and so on. And, uh, and so that uh, sort of uh, intervention reminded Chris of a number of the really important questions that he'd been thinking about theoretically in relation to language. And I think I'll pass over to Chris now, and you can perhaps talk about some of them. Yes, so um, Jerome mentioned the inaugural conference of the Paris Linguistic Society back in um, 1865, uh, which had in its statutes that they would never accept any papers on the origin of language. And um, as Jerome pointed out, the reason was they were just getting exasperated with these arguments which just couldn't be settled. So just to sort of um, give a flavor, you had the, and, and this was a, 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 big, a, a theoretician called Max Muller, he, he did a sort of table of all the different theories which were circulating, and you had the Bow Wow theory, um, and you had the Ding Dong theory, and the Heave Ho, Heave Ho theory. 
and, um, and they're kind of interesting because they were about the sort of mechanisms you, you might think of, you know, like you know the bow wow is animal imitation the, the ding dong is everything has a kind of sound and if you make the sound that means the thing you that you know that would normally emit the sound and then the heave ho is you know work at, you know how do you coordinate your rolling a log you go heave ho heave ho and that would be the first language and so it was just completely exasperating and um, the, the band was effective for all those years from 1865 until till 1990 because the Paris Linguistic Society was the, the most prestigious society of linguistics um, in the world and their band was taken up by all the other world's um, um, societies of linguistics and um, it, it was kind of it was that whole pr prohibition that taboo was broken in 1990 there was a, a, a book called language and species by Derek Bickerton that, that, that was quite popular and uh, Stephen Pinker that I'm sure some of you have heard of he wrote a book called the language instinct he, he published an article on the evolutionary emergence of language and what happened was that because of the sort of dam that built up prohibiting anyone from having a theory <laughs> you went from no series at all to far too many theories I mean, suddenly everyone had a theory, all sorts of theories, and it's still kind of the case today that we've got so many theories. Almost everyone thinks it's well. Let's part in. I mean, you know, I might, I've got a theory. You know, other people have theories, and it's not very good to have too many theories. <laughs> in science, you want some kind of theory which is testable, uh, and because it's testable, it kind of um, ends up being kind of a, you know forming a consensus, an agreement. So science is, uh, when, what we talk about, when we say science, you know, some scientists might have an idea, but it doesn't really become science until that idea is um, accepted. Um, when I introduce this topic, I am often met with this question, but Chris, I mean, what is the problem? I mean, hang on a bit, surely, I mean, language is so useful. So many things we can do with language. We'll share our dreams, make plans, gossip. Surely it's obvious that a clever creature like humans with the large brains we've got would um, evolve language. It's just, you know, how could, he manage, how could we manage without language? Um, and so it is sometimes hard to get over the fact that the problem of the origin of language is nowadays considered by scientists perhaps the hardest problem in science. It's as difficult as that. I think that the problem is insoluble in the sense that there can be no such thing as a theory of the origins of language. And I think people that think you can have a theory of the origins of language have been making a huge mistake. What you might be able to have, and this is why people have been shying away from it, is a theory of everything. Because language is so bound up with everything else that makes us human that it's kind of foolish to imagine you can have language evolving without all those other things. When I've given uh, talks in the past, I've, I've sometimes held up a credit card, said, look at this card, it's amazing. It does so many things, this credit card. You can phone up somebody, somebody in the hotel, you know, other side of the <laughs> United States, and they, they'll, you know, they'll give you a lovely meal and put you up, and you can stay all week, and all these things you can do with a credit card. But of course, you know, a credit card only works if you've got a banking system, and a fraud detection system, and electronics, and all those things which go with having a credit card. Or again, you know, a keyboard. Yeah, really useful to have a keyboard. But I mean, a keyboard in the rainforest. Imagine evolving humans, you know, with a keyboard. <laughs> what would you do with it? To make a keyboard of any value, you'd have to have all the other things. And I'm arguing, I've always argued, it's the same with language. Language for a chimpanzee in the rainforest would be completely and utterly useless. The idea that somehow a chimp which had language could do so many more things, it could make plans and remember and share with its demons, I mean, that is just nonsense. Language would be a huge hindrance. And in fact, chimpanzees that have been taught something rather like language, the American Sign Language in the human family, and just to say, um, bonobos and chimpanzees raised in a human, caring, loving uh, family environment, it's not, they don't, they, they, they're pretty good at getting the basics of some kind of rudimentary sign language. You can say to a kanzi or you know, a particular the chimp, Go to the fridge, open the door, take the orange juice out, bring it onto the table, put the orange juice on the hat, put the hat on the orange juice. <laughs> they do all those things. And way more than that, it's, they're, they're creative. Um, there's a lovely story about um, a chimp who um, was taught by its um, carer um, the word shit, the sign language for shit. 
so when its bottom was being wiped, you know, th that would be the word you'd use. And then this particular chimp got very cross with the carer and said, you shit. Okay, well that's metaphor. <laughs> and it, it invented that. And then it invented things like, for, it didn't have a word for radish, and it, and it used the word cry fruit. And that was very, so the chimps are capable of inventing metaphor in order to convey ideas to another creature. Okay, in the wild, none of that is used. And there's no sign of anything remotely symbolic that anyone's detected among any non-human creature, including close relatives of ours like chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, right, why is it the most difficult problem? I kind of explained it because we need, we need all the other things. We need a sort of theory of everything. And of course the question arises, well, can you have a theory of everything? <laughs> How can he, and, you know, but that's, and social anthropologists can say, well, what do you mean by a theory of everything? Well, a theory of all the, thi the, cr the critical things that would make humans human and a human social system a human one. Um, and um, in order to get to that, we would need all the different things which we might think of as different levels, like a cosmological system, a kinship system, an economic system, a you know, a system of sexual taboos and other, root, uh, other rules. We need all of those to be somehow collapsed into one thing um, and then we would need ex an explanation of that one simple thing which later on becomes separated out into different distinguishable levels. And with hunter-gatherers, you don't really have a thing called, I don't think, an economic system. I mean, we have the economy. Hunter gatherers, do they have the economy? I'm not quite sure, really, because the, the, the economy would be the kind of demand sharing, the kind of production and distribution which goes on, but it's not a separate sort of, it hasn't separated out in the way in which things get separated out in our um, stratified cultures. So, okay, um, why does it matter? Why does the origin of language matter? It, um, I, want to, I was just going to read out a lo rather lovely um, description of the problem we have with trying to explain everything um, within the framework of science in the sense of natural science. I mean, most people think real science is like physics or astronomy or chemistry or biology. That's that proper science, natural science. Um, and this is from a very wonderful philosopher of language um, emerging out of the Russian Revolution, Mikhail Bakhtin the dialogic imagination and he puts it this way about the natural sciences the entire methodological apparatus of the mathematical and natural sciences is directed toward mastery over mute objects brute things that do not reveal themselves in words that do not comment on themselves <laughs> So with natural science, you don't respond to other voices. You dissect nature, you try to control nature, you try to understand nature. Of course, you work out the responses of nature to your interventions. Of course, that's a critical part of it. But you're not listening to the voices of the animals, the trees, as participants in a two-way conversation. And um, the argument I've got with Jerome, of course, is that we can't restrict ourselves to this thing called natural science in order to explain the evolutionary emergence of language, even though that has been the dominant paradigm in attempts to work out what language is and more recently how language evolved. I'll just give one example. The most famous linguist in the world for a very long period of time has been um, Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky did more than anyone else to turn the, s the study of, of language into a rigorously natural science. Uh, and what he said is that language is a natural object. It's like, to study language is like studying a snowflake or a constellation. Language is an object in the head. It's like a little miniature computer. And um, it's located somewhere in the head. It has these properties of digital computation and to study it, you don't need social science because language is 
not for communicating. It's not you, you don't in Chomsky's model you don't have a, a speaker and a listener. You have an individual. He calls it eye language, computing. Um, and so this is the the kind of model. Um, and clearly that's a rather I think difficult idea for any social uh, anthropologist to accept. But it it prevailed for a very long time until. And this is what happened in the 90s. I, with a colleague Jim Herford in Edinburgh, founded a thing called Evolang, which is a society for the study of the, of the evolution of language. Once that taboo had been broken in 1990, I thought, well, I, I just thought, I, haven't, I can't come up with a theory of the origin of language just plugging it out of my head. I had a few ideas, but I just thought, this is such an enormously challenging question. We need to get all the primatologists, social anthropologists, archaeologists, neu neuroscientists right around the world to work on this most difficult of questions because until we've solved this question the problem is that science itself doesn't join up. Science, you can study things which don't talk to us, that's called natural science because historians, anthropologists, s social scientists, the whole point about the humanities and the social sciences is that we study objects which have a voice. Humans who had a voice in the past, we try to work out what that voice was, um, and of course hunter-gatherers and other humans have voices, we listen to them. But in, until we've solved the problem of the origin of language, we, we, that stops at mute creatures, as Bakhtin points out, and as soon as it gets to the point in evolution where biological creatures, namely evolving hominids, started speaking, suddenly science has to stop because at that point we need to escape the confines of the natural sciences and do something rather rather different. Um, right, this is going to take too long unless I cut a few corners. <laughs> I'm going to bring Jerome back in in a moment. Um, the, the critical thing about um, symbolic culture is that it consists of things that have no existence in the real world. So symbolic culture consists of um, spirits, divinities, um, goblins, football scores, um, money, marriage. These are things which obviously natural science can't study because they only exist on the basis of collective belief. So as soon as the belief collapses, the things themselves dissolve. I mean, the most simple way of, the simplest illustration of that is actually in our culture, is money. You know, money does not exist, it's a hallucination. But because it's a collective hallucination, because we all believe in this thing, it's hugely <laughs> important to all of us. We can't survive without money. But it is, it is just like goblins and forest spirits. It's a, it's, it exists, it's kind of objectively true for us, but it's only true as long as faith in it survives. As soon as the faith in the currency system collapses, the things in your pocket, which you thought were money, or the digital things on your <laughs> smartphone, they collapse. As, and uh, of course, the whole point of science itself, as we understand it in the West, the whole point, point of science as understood by, say, René Descartes, is that you do not confuse things which exist in the real world with collective hallucinations. And yet, of course, the whole of symbolic culture is kind of a hallucination. It consists of what philosophers call institutional facts, which are facts which exist, as I said, only because you believe in them. And language is a part of that. Okay, and then I'm going to bring in Joan in, a, in, a, in a <laughs> just, a, just a second. Um, uh, um, any part of language, as any uh, any part of language is kind of symbolic, and as symbolic expression is actually by chimpanzee standards or primate standards it's a fake it's a falsehood it's um, it's a an, in the animal world the listeners need to be sure that they're not being deceived being tricked there's a massive sort of discipline called signal evolution theory within biology started by a, 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 an ornithologist called Ahmad Zahavi and his point was that animals need reliability in signals. And because of that, 
um, the, the sender of a signal needs to chain their signal, anchor that signal in some part of reality, in some part of the body, and therefore some component of the of the bodily state. When we speak, there's no connection with what I'm saying now and my bodily state. I mean, maybe a tiny bit of if I'm getting a bit breathless or overexcited or something, you might notice the speed goes up or down or something, but my words are not anchored in anything real in the room. Um, and it's really difficult to work out if you start out with chimpanzee vocal calls. How could those be uh, a precursor of what I'm doing when I'm moving my tongue and my lips and my soft palate and my you know, nasal opening and so on, making these little off-on um, changes? How can you get from primate hoots, screams, grunts, how can you get from those things to language? And actually, it's really a really difficult problem. Partly because chimpanzees, for example, when they when they give a pant hoot, <laughs> and it won't go on, but it's uh, you know, in order to con be convincing with a pant hoot, you get a great chorus of these hoots, um, and they shut the, the the tongue down. That the thing which we think of as the most critical part of speaking, the tongue, which is one of the many articulators, as we call them, parts of the m of the m of the mouth which we use to make the, the vowels and consonants of speech. When chimpanzees make their calls, they shut down the tongue, they don't open and shut the lips, and, they, and the reason for that is because they have to convince the listener that they really mean it. And as soon as a, a chimpanzee, when we think about it logically, as soon as an, evol as an evolving human, maybe originally some kind of ape, began to manipulate their vocalizations, manipulate their calls in ways which no longer reflected anything in the real world, can you see what would happen? What would happen if some evolving human with a still something like a chimpanzee-style social system, chimpanzees of course are Machiavellian, they're always trying to trick each other, what would happen if one particular chimpanzee got really clever at faking its calls? Like, if, you know, they, they have a food call. When they see food, you know, they salivate and you can almost hear the sound of the salivation. You know there's really food there. Why? Because they can't fake a food call. It's the same with the copulation squeal, the pantit and the various other things. All these calls are linked to real things. Supposing in the course of evolution, in order to get to something like speech, a clever individual began to fake by using its tongue or its lips. What would happen? Stop believing. They would stop believing it. So my problem was to work out how faking could become an evolutionarily stable strategy. How is it that in the course of human evolution, our ancestors began to fake because all words by chimpanzee standards are completely fake. Okay, how could faking work? Why would it, faking wouldn't be punished by being ignored? Um, Jeremiah, are you prepared to give a little bit more on um, <coughs> hunting Lewis? Because the, the solution is this one. It's, it's, it's what must have happened is that our ancestors started faking toward listeners who kind of never got it who couldn't like, punish that faking because they, weren't, they didn't make fake calls among themselves and so were always going to be fooled. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the, yeah, the, the little antelope, meow, meow, meow. I've, and I've seen this happen quite a few times. You know, you do it and, and they come running out of the undergrowth and then they see this horrible human standing there and they think, oh no, get out of here, Shoom! and off they go again. Then you go, meow, 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 then whoosh, they're back again, <gasps> horrible human, Shoom! off again. And it, it is that inability to understand that that call could be faked, which is what draws the antelope back every time, every time. And it's what makes hunting so feasible for these hunter-gatherers in the forest. They have found that by imitating that they can draw the animal to them so when you think of the chimpanzees so trying to fake oh it's not really very nice food <laughs> but it is actually something great and they're gorging themselves and then a few of the other chimpanzees see oh look he's bullshitting us and 
and, and start a fight, it becomes a big deal, it becomes a real problem. So the other chimpanzees are mounting resistance against the fakery that the one chimpanzee is thinking about. Whereas the little Daiko who's been hiding, munching his little roots and shoots over in the corner in the forest there, can't mount resistance against me because each time it sounds just like his mate who, from the other side of the uh, tree or wherever it is. So the uh, ability to mount resistance is what uh, really does prevent other animals from ever getting to what we would think of as language or any sort of symbolic communication. So the real problem for understanding the evolution of language is not to think of what genetic transformation in someone's brain happened or what weird freaky sort of mutation caused people to start speaking, but it's to think about what would be the context that would enable that resistance to not develop so that that fakery could start to flourish, that language or the things we call symbolic communication could start to be instituted. And that really is the crux of the uh, problem of language evolution. And because mostly natural scientists try and think about you know, genetic and other forms of sort of non-social, non-talking, non-human uh, ways of explaining the problem, they get stuck. Um, and it, I mean, Chomsky, for instance, in an astonishing book on the evolution of language he co-wrote with somebody else, um, proposes that there was a cosmic ray, that some weird sunburst spot that blitzed some man's mind, and it made him so smart that language was suddenly created, and, and then he went off and you know, mated with all the females because they were like, whoa, uh, and, and suddenly language was among human beings. I mean, extraordinary from such intelligent people that such, uh, you know, sort of puerile uh, uh, ideas could be suggested. But what, so what really Chris has tried to explain to you is that the real crux of this problem is how to overcome that resistance. And that's where uh, listening to the diversity of different communicative forms that these hunter-gatherers have and still use really provides very important clues to help us to recreate that sort of what, what would it have been that would stop that uh, resistance from forming. And so in that example of the ow, 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 you can start to see the diker can't mount resistance against me because I'm not another diker. I'm just a, a, a bullshitting human being who's faking a call. And, and there are many other fake calls we fake the calls we call crocodiles to us to get them out of the water so they come onto land so we can catch them. We fake m uh, baby monkeys falling out of trees so that the big males will come down low enough out of the tree looking for where the child is uh, so that we can get them with our crossbows. So there are lots of ways of faking uh, that are really central to hunter-gatherers' livelihoods. But one of the most important uh, uh, forms of fakery is, is song. And it's not faking uh, for each other when we sing. But uh, we, this happened when a BBC wanted to make a, a documentary about the Bambangeli's musical style, this polyphonic singing I was just talking about. And it is extraordinarily beautiful. It is remarkably complex. It's uh, taken French, a uh, French ethnomusicologist to develop a really quite sophisticated recording mechanism to actually uh, break down the polyphony into its constituent melodies to understand how they combine, what the musical principles of that combination are. Um, they're now uh, using some AI to try and develop algorithms to describe what these uh, 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 the, or the ways that you can combine these melodies in the polyphony. But for Bambangeli people, of course, they grow up listening to this music, making this music, and so it's just something which they learn as an instinctive part of, of growing up. And uh, when we were making this uh, uh, record, or we were with, I uh, was with this uh, BBC reporter, and we were recording the music. Um, he said, so, so why do you sing like this? And one of the women said, well, it's to keep, to keep the animals away. It's to scare the animals when we're in the forest because they have a beautiful way of yodeling and, and the musical melodies are made up of this yodeling style. So it's a, a movement between a chest voice and a head voice. And I won't try and do it because I'm a terrible singer and uh, you'll just laugh and I'll feel embarrassed. Um, but, uh, but when the Bambanjilla do it, it really is very beautiful and it's this movement of head to chest which which sends the sound out and they, they, they have an expression you, you throw the sound out you send it out of your neck and you have to open your neck wide in order to sing like this and methnomusicologists describe it as one of the most relaxed ways if you if you to sing effectively in this yodeling style you need to really relax your whole 
uh, vocal cords. So um, as women walk in the forest collecting f uh, mushrooms or whatever it is, there's a beautiful uh, recording online, Women Gathering Mushrooms. Uh, have a listen to it sometime if you like. Uh, it's very beautiful. And, uh, uh, and, and so they're singing out these yodeled uh, uh, melodies, and it's a way of warning the animals that, look, we're coming along. So, you know, just let, let, we don't want to bump into you. You don't want us to bump into you either. So let's just keep ourselves separate. And, and this way of uh, accommodating uh, for each other in the forest is actually something that other hunter-gatherers use music for too. Um, <coughs> and so uh, singing then becomes a way of announcing yourself to those animals. And, uh, uh, and Chris and I thought about this quite a lot, and we were thinking about the early sort of context of uh, when early hominins came down into savannas and started moving around in these landscapes which uh, were, were populated with actually a terrifying array of, of really big cats. Uh, I mean you had lions you know standing this high, huge things wearing, weighing you know several hundred well six or seven hundred kilograms. Um, saber-toothed tigers, I think there were six or seven types of saber-toothed tigers and we are really good fodder, food for those kinds of cats. I mean, if you look at the antelopes that they eat today, um, you know, we're, we're excellent food for, for such animals. And by all means, you know, when you look at some of the archaeological excavations of early hominins, you find, you know, big tooth marks in them from saber tooths and, and other uh, felines. So how would those early people, we haven't got big claws, we haven't got, you know, big sharp teeth, we're not very fast runners. Yeah, how did we uh, manage to, to remain in those landscapes without becoming regular food for, the, for those animals? And so we started to think about what those Benjeli women were saying about why uh, they sing. They sing to keep the animals away. Singing uh, for our lives. So. Yes, yeah, singing for our lives. I mean, sometimes, for instance, you know, we'd be moving camp, and uh, one of the men, the hunters, would notice that we're being trailed by a leopard. And leopards do this, they trail monkeys as well in the trees in case one of those kids falls out of the trees. Kids do fall out of the trees from time to time. And same with the human groups, sometimes the kids start playing and not paying attention. And it's quite uh, consistent that leopards in the forest will only go for uh, an, well, humans which are lower than about my navel um, size. Um, and so for instance, one time a crippled lady who had had polio who walked on her hands, she uh, told everyone to carry on ahead because you know, she didn't want to slow the camp down, it was already getting late. And, uh, and then she didn't turn up in the evening, and so the next morning they went out to look for her. And, uh, and then when they got to a particular part on the path, they saw that she'd actually been taken by a leopard, and there'd been this terrible fight through the forest, and she must have really fought this leopard hard. But in the end, the leopard uh, had, had taken her, and we, we, no one could find the, the traces of her body. So. Um, that there is a genuine fear, and, and this is really, and so when it happens that a leopard is trailing the camp, what the women will do is they sing all night, and they huddle together, and, and when women, uh, when we do uh, masana, which is what this is called, uh, play is what they call their, their, their most sacred rituals, uh, when, when we do masana, they uh, huddle together, you rest your limbs on each other's legs, you, you rest your arms and shoulders on each other, uh, you, you really bring your bodies together, you melt your bodies together, and then you all sing your different melodies, and so you sort of meld your voices together as well, and it's in that melding that then suddenly this new song comes ahead, uh, above, over the, the top, and, and your bodies make you feel uh, as one, you, you, and suddenly you have an energy to sing which just keeps going and going, and, and so some of these rituals go for three days, you know, people will sing for three days, you'll have a couple of hours snooze here and there, um, but, but people are just keep going and, and, and the fatigue it, it facilitates some of the trance states that people enter into um, because you don't people don't uh, you know drink uh, funny brews and things and so on there uh, you just use the song as a way of transforming uh, your consciousness into this sort of uh, joy state they have it they call it isengo um, and so um, this made us think that well what one of the things that perhaps those early hominins would have used in order to keep safe on these uh, savannas would have been the uh, singing, singing for their lives. And you could imagine, uh, and we haven't really talked about alloparenting and the role of uh, women, perhaps that you can come in on there, but, uh, but you know, these early groups of hominins would have been more or less women with their children. Um, and uh, you would have had perhaps these alpha males, similar in the, the sort of hyreme structure of other primates, roaming around on the outskirts, hoping to mate 
uh, when they had the opportunity. But, but essentially, these women with these really costly kids that they had to breastfeed for months on end and, and look after would have been at a serious disadvantage. They couldn't just have run and climbed up a tree, uh, perhaps as one of the males might have done. They had to you know, stay. And so grouping together, singing for their lives, would suddenly create an opportunity for developing that vocal dexterity. Um, there is a one chimpanzee, or is it a gorilla? I can't remember. And there's a, you know, the, the carer, the human carer of this animal uh, says he can speak. And he, she's got a recording. And she says it's him saying mama. And, uh, and, and maybe it is. But, uh, but, but the point is that his vocal dexterity is so limited that he can't make the range of sounds we can. And we have extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinary ability to make very fine uh, distinctions in our vocal uh, utter utterances. And so that early singing for their lives could have been one way that human beings developed that vocal dexterity. So for women, it would have been something that helped them to preserve themselves in the face of these fearsome predators. And for men, it would have been something that would have helped them to think about this meow, meow, deceiving the outsider here being the, the animals around them as opposed to other human beings. So then no resistance is being made by the social group. And slowly we start to develop a, something much more interesting, which is trust. We start to develop a sense of us as a group with those dangerous, fearsome animals out there or those prey animals that we want to eat. And those are, uh, according to Chris and I, the key component, not just us, there are other uh, uh, theorists who, who, who agree with us on this. Trust uh, uh, and, and we intentionality, that sense of ourselves as a group, is crucial to establishing the preconditions for language. And maybe, Chris, you want to carry on? Yeah. I mean, I yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, yes, of course. I mean, we can both carry, carry on, on for, for, on for on. hours and hours and hours, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, remind me, make sure I... Trust. Yeah, yes, but, um, of course, but um, before that, um, okay, so um, going back a little bit now to the hardest problem in science, um, there are a whole number of conundrums uh, which just seem to be insoluble, really, but one of them, I'll just start with the first one. Um, it, one of the things that Noam Chomsky taught us, which I think is a good idea, is the idea that human children have um, almost a language instinct. He calls it a module. But the point about a child is that as it reaches like one and two years old, it, it's, it has an appetite to acquire this most complex theoretical structure, which is the grammar of a language. It's a very, very complicated structure, and yet the child seems to pick up this theoretical structure almost as if it knew already what a human language might be. It's equipped with some sort of instinct um, in a way that although, as I mentioned, chimpanzees brought up with humans, they can kind of learn a little bit of rather rudimentary sign language and they can invent metaphors. Grammar is, no, no, they don't. <laughs> They've got no idea about how to cope with, with that. And yet, as I said, a little, a little a human child has clearly got some pre-equipped capacity for um, that. Now, if it's an instinct, um, and there's a huge literature on this, the book to read is Stephen Pinker, The Language Instinct, a very persuasive book. Um, it's a very odd instinct because all the rest of the instincts which we have, the sexual instinct, maternity, aggression, all sorts of instincts. You can see among our primate cousins, monkeys and apes, you know, they've got a, a, a sexual instinct too. They have a maternal instinct, all those instincts. The grammar instinct, <laughs> if you want to call it that, does zero. And so the problem is how do you develop a rather complex cognitive capacity, if you don't like the word instinct, how do you develop that in, in, in evolutionary time? Now you can say, let's give ourselves a long time, let's give ourselves six million years because you need quite a long time to get an instinct like that up and running. Well, that, that's really odd that early hominins would have had the capacity for grammar, like something like a language instinct. How come, given that they evidently didn't use it? So how would you get, I mean, imagine some creature evolving eyes without ever seeing. It just seems a bit odd, because the, the earliest evidence we have for the use of language, or any kind of evidence for what, what we call symbolic culture, 
which is like, for, for example, the, the, um, the, the, what's called the ochre record. Red ochre is, for archaeologists, the, s the first indication in the archaeological record that some kind of symbolic cultural rituals were being performed. That doesn't happen till not half a million years ago at the most. And it really gets underway about 160,000 years ago. So if you have an early date, it's odd that you'd have an instinct which was never used. If you have a late date, which is, uh, you just don't have time to develop an instinct from nothing. So how does it get there? I mean, there are, s there are solutions to that. And rather than going through all the paradoxes, I'll cut a few corners and simply say, right, for me and for Jerome, that instinct is actually the instinct for play. Play is creative in the way that language is. Play is sort of symbolic in the sense of when, when two, um, say, chimpanzees, the young ones are, are play fighting, they're kind of using, you know, aggressive actions, but kind of not really. It's sort of not exactly fake, but, a, you know, a pretend bite, a pretend hit, a pretend kick is kind of a, a not really bite or kick. And you could sort of argue, and it has been argued, Gregory Bateson is one who invented this idea, that the origin of symbolism it goes right, right back, and it's, it's the instinct for play. The problem is that play in play fighting in non-human primates um, doesn't last into adulthood. So childhood, or it, uh, childhood is not quite the right word when you're using when you're talking about um, apes. But anyway, it, during the the, 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 the pre-adolescent years, they do play. When uh, they've come of age, when these male young male chimpanzees, for example, come of age and the sexual hormones get active, you can't afford to lose and usually what happens is that the play fighting turns into real fighting. Somehow or other, given what I was saying earlier about symbolic culture, that instinct for play and that playfulness in, in, in relationships manage to govern society as a whole. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that a hunter-gatherer society, any human society in a sense, all the, all the ritual, all the kinship systems, all of that, all if you, what it, you can argue that it's kind of pretend play writ large, pretend play embracing the whole society. And, and in our culture, if you think about it, all the things which we do, which are sort of ex really uh, emotionally arouse us, all the theatre, all the literature, all the, you know, the songs, all, the, all that you can argue is, is an expression of play collectivised. And what happens with humans is the most amazing thing of all which is that whereas with non-human primates, sex uh, ends by sort of demolishing play. So when sex comes onto the scene, the play fights tend to real fight. Se sex clearly, you know, you can say it's, it's great to have sex, but among primates is a cause of violence and competition and conflict. And of course, among humans, when people murder each other, it's very often, of course, we know, we know that, don't we, about sex. Somehow a human formal kinship system is, the, is a, a result of establishing the rules of the game encompassing even probably the most difficult thing that we do as humans the most difficult thing to subject to the rules of a game would be sex and yet of course we have the incest taboo we have mother-in-law avoidances we have all sort any any human kinship system with a set of rules for how to behave in relationship to sexual matters so one of the ways in which Marshall Silence put it a long time ago in a wonderful article called The Origin of Society, way back in 1960, he said, before this amazing event when we became human, sex had organized society. We became human when society, as he put it, succeeded in organizing sex, when collectively somehow we, su we managed to subordinate sex to some kind of rules, as if it was a rule-governed game. That's what a kinship system is. Now. I'm going to bring Jerome in, in again in, a, in, in just a moment, hopefully no more than about two minutes. I was saying that there can't be such a thing as a theory of the origin of language. What we need is a theory of everything. And actually, Jerome and I have published an article called Toward a Theory of Everything and a book called Human Origins, Approaches from Social Anthropology, edited by Camilla. We, we, we titled it that, a little bit bold, I suppose, calling it Theory of Everything. But what I was saying earlier is that you can't have a theory of everything unless everything is simple. Unless all the different levels, the language, the ritual, the kinship, all those things are collapsed into one plane, then maybe we could explain that so that everything kind of emerges simultaneously. I'll just say what the problem here is. The problem is that you can argue that 
you can have arguments about which came first, language or cooperation. So how can we cooperate without language? How can you plan ahead, work out what to do, all get to do it together if you don't have language? But then the, the reverse is also the problem. How would you even have language if nobody trusted each other and uh, there wasn't some f sort of fundamental cooperation happening so already to make you know, words kind of worth anything with all the trust that you need in order to use uh, language? Well, I've got another way of introducing um, Jerome, which is this, uh, I mean, what, what, was what we're both saying, actually, there are so many occasions um, uh, an indigenous hunter-gatherer concept from, in this case, the Bayakya, is just clarifying. Clarifying because it doesn't make harmful, difficult distinctions. So Masana, Jerome was mentioning, Masana is this Benjeli word which does a marvellous thing. It, it collapses into one concept, children playing and adults performing their religious rituals. It's all play. I think that's brilliant. The religion is just playing, but it's just adults playing. Use the same word. It's just so, it's such a clarifying idea because actually religion does come out of play, taken seriously, but all, all when children play games, it's deadly serious. You know, children playing some you know, pretend play game, you don't want to spoil the sport, messing up the game, it's really, there's a kind of circle of, you know, which needs to be protected of this pretense. And religion is another way in, in which we can see that, the, 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 almost the most valuable thing is to be allowed to believe in things which physically don't exist, as, as of course all the world's religions do. So, what might have been this one thing which emerged where everything was sort of simultaneous? And I'm going to ask um, Jerome to explain Mwajo, because in Mwajo you have the cooperation, the sex, the linguistics, the rule governed, the, the mimesis, the, s the singing, the hu I mean, all sorts of things, all, and that's why we've called our book When Eve Laughed, involved in a kind of laughter which in itself is a remarkable thing. Humans laugh in a way which is contagious. When we laugh, the, the laughing itself is funny. It's true that chimpanzees sort of laugh, but you've got to poke them. You've got to, got to tickle them, and they kind of make a sort of heavy breathing sound. And many people say that rats laugh. Human laughter is radically different. Human laughter is a contagious, strange, cackling sound. Um, and we're arguing that somehow laughter and language are connected. It's not, uh, they're very different. Laughter is nothing like language. There's no grammar in laughter. There's no meaning in the sounds of laughter. But when everyone's had a good laugh over something, if you work out what is laughter, where does it come from, it's always overcoming some threat, dissolving the tension, and the laughter is the sound of relief from the tension. We could go into that a little bit more. But laughter sets the scene. Once everyone's had a laugh about something, something difficult very often, now there's a kind of level of trust within which language can really flourish for the first time. But I want to hand over to Jerome to explain what this because I think that this idea of it's this idea of mojo, actually it is kind of the first word, but it's not just a word, it's kind of everything else. Over to Jerome. So the first word was this. Well, I think there just needs to be a wee bit of uh, context. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, part of the problem in chimpanzee society is you've got this alpha male who dominates the whole e space through violence and and you know if another male comes along and wants to replace him he's got to beat him up and they've got to fight and almost to the death till you know one of them flees uh, <coughs> and and that creates a context of extreme mistrust because the females are then vying for favor from that alpha and that alpha if he suspects that that child is not his, can go and kill it. And, and uh, there's a lot of infanticide in chimpanzee society, particularly when a new alpha takes over. Then he'll go around trying to murder as many of the children of the old alpha as he can get his hands on. So that, uh, that context, I mean, you, you, you can just imagine, because, of course, we know uh, is sadly what's happening again in our own societies. And one of the reasons I, at the beginning, said I really don't think of the Bambangeli, the Bayaka people as primitive or fossils, they are extremely sophisticated because they've managed to maintain 
an egalitarian order, despite all the very complex things that people do to scheme and try and get power over each other. They've managed to each time thwart it so that still today they live in these egalitarian uh, groups. <coughs> and one of the key processes by which they maintain that egalitarianism is Mwajo, is what Chris has just been talking about. And Mwajo is a very particular type of performance, public performance, that's most often uh, conducted by widows, elderly women who've lost their husbands. Um, <coughs> one of the reasons men don't do Mwajo is because if they did, it could start fights. But when women start Mwajo, it's often because someone has misbehaved. So for instance, uh, there's a very fierce elephant hunter um, and his wife was having her hair plaited. And uh, he came back from the forest and he saw her having her hair plaited. And Benjeli women at that time didn't often plait their hair. It was something they were copying from the neighboring farming populations. And he was uh, you know, curious, why is she plaiting her hair all of a sudden? And he didn't say anything at the time, but by evening time it had worked on him so hard that he was furious with his wife and he started chasing her around and trying to beat her and saying, who's your boyfriend? Who are you trying to make yourself beautiful for? Rah, 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 rah. And <coughs> it became a real scene because the man is extremely strong. And all her sisters and girlfriends had to come round and try and protect her from him as he was trashing and they have a, a lovely expression, uh, smashing the house down because they live in these rather, uh, you know, liana with leaf, uh, uh, little geodesic huts. When, when a couple start fighting inside their hut, you see arms and fists and legs and bodies and the hut stretches this way and then it stretches that way and then crawl, it, it collapses. And, um, and anyway, and, and so there was all this going on. So <coughs> finally, you know, some of her girlfriends just took her and they just put her in her own huts uh, with them so that she slept with them that night to keep her away from him. So the next morning, some elderly ladies started just sitting there and one of them started plaiting the hair of one of the other ladies and then around as, as this went on for some time this other old lady started to pretend huh, so why are you plaiting your hair like that what's so special about you eh? why are you making your hair so beautiful who are you beautiful for and started just repeating all the things without saying of course that she was mimicking the husband and and quickly the children and all the other people who were around camp started to join in and look around oh, oh, oh yeah so laughing at the uh, they're very good at making this very comical much better than me and, uh, and, and so in that humor that's generated by everybody now laughing at this outrageous behavior from this man, and then I saw the man come along and he stood and, and very quickly understood who was the, the center of the community's laughter. And, uh, and he sat and he, he tried to swallow it and, and you know, find it funny as well, but he couldn't and he had to flee into the forest. But, uh, and the women just carried on, carried on, carried on, and everyone carried on laughing at it. But uh, th in fact, if he had wanted it to stop, what he had to do was stay there long enough to be able to laugh at himself. And if he had laughed at the women performing him being a, a fool, then they would have stopped immediately. And it really is extraordinary. You see the culprit suddenly start laughing, and it's happened to me, and, and when I started laughing, suddenly <laughs> it just stops. <laughs> And then everyone just carries on and does what they were doing. And, uh, and, and this is Mwajo. And it's something that's done whenever people do behavior which is just unacceptable. Uh, the old women start to imitate it, to, to create a pantomime out of it. They, they mimic it. And they very rarely use words. They never name the person that they're imitating. Um, but they do it in such a comical way that everybody starts laughing. And it's often the, the onlookers who start commenting on what they're doing and giving uh, sort of a moral uh, 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 commentary uh, of what's happening. And in that moral commentary, they're sharing the moral values of the community with the community. So it's a way that you can have uh, uh, a sort of, uh, it's not a judgment, but, a, but a, a shared expression of the morals of that community without having someone who is responsible for doing that, for saying, this is what our law, this is how we are, which of course implies power and in inequality, status and hierarchy. So in Mwajo, you have something which is very powerful in establishing a, a rule of, of order. It's very often women against men, uh, and, and it's something which establishes trust because, of course, everyone's laughing at the same thing. So we are getting a sense of ourselves as having a certain set of values. Do you want to finish off there, Chris? Yep. So, uh,
Um, oh yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps finish by saying that um, in this year, actually, the theory that I developed without so much input from Jerome a long time ago, um, but which has been increasingly inspired by um, the, these concepts, which are not Western concepts, which are so helpful. Mwajo is such a helpful concept, as is Masana, as are so many others. So we, we won't have time to do Akila, which is another critical one. Um, what happened early this year, I, the, a, a, a very um, um, brilliant um, specialist in syntax, um, he's called Cedric Brooks, I'm not, probably not pronouncing his name quite right, but he was, um, is um, a, a, a very s um, well-known, authoritative, initially follower of Noam Chomsky, and especially in Chomsky's um, latest paradigm called minimalism. And um, he wrote an article in which he built on some stuff I've been writing for a long time, and I'll just describe what it is. Um, Chomsky got a few things right. One of them was the uh, I perception, the insight, that the, f the formal structure of language is indeed um, digital. I say indeed because, of course, Chomsky was working with the US military um, in the period when computers were just being invented, and the, the whole point of his work was to um, help the military to um, design um, computer systems to guide um, missiles, and these would have been digital computers. Um, and his, uh, his insight, which was came from somebody called Roman Jakobsen, who came from the Russian Revolution, rather like Bakhtin did, there's a long story here. His insight was that um, digital structure marks out human language from all animal communication systems. And the issue is now, how do, we, how do we get from an analog system of communication, that's a more or less gradualistic system, where what matters with a, I mean, what matters with a chimpanzee hoot is, is, is not off or, uh, nothing off or on about it. It's about more or less um, loud, repetitive, s displaying anger. It's, a c it's what um, signal evolution theorists call a costly signal. So when you've got, when you've got to overcome skepticism in your audience, and with all animals, there's a, there's a degree of skepticism. There's always some, even between kin, there's always an element of conflict or potential conflict between the speaker and the listener, if you like. And, to, and what has to happen is that the signaler on the hoof, at the moment of emitting the signal, has to convince the listener to take the signal seriously. So any trust has to be sort of built on the hoof. And you can only do that with what, what's called costly signaling. You can't just have a little twitch of your tongue, a little note change from high to low. That's, that's a cheap signal and it just won't, it won't cut it. So animal signals are always costly in the sense that these, the signal has to invest their, their body in the signal. And there's only so much that they can afford to put into that signal. And a very skeptical listener will push the, 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 the signaler to show what that limit is and the signal is always going to be evaluated on, a, on an analog scale. Costly signals are always analog. And everyone know what I mean by analog. It's, it's a more or less thing as opposed to an off, on and off thing. Well, clearly part of language is analog, how loud you are, how high pitched you are, and all those things, how big the person is <laughs> speaking. But the critical points that make a difference in meaning are actually digital. Um, and that was discovered by Roman Jakobsen, taken over by Noam Chomsky. And the idea is that we, we have this vocal apparatus, no different really from the vocal apparatus of a, of a chimpanzee or other uh, great ape, but we have these on-off switches. So you, you can switch a b to a p by switching off the vocalization. Okay, you change bin into pin. It's not just a different sound, it's a different meaning, a completely different meaning. You can say, um, we will meet you tomorrow um, and then uh, very different if you add a little M in front of the eat. We will, so if you, we will meet you tomorrow, take off the M, um, doesn't cost anything. We will eat you tomorrow. That's a life or death distinction. So with language, you can make life or death distinctions at like almost zero cost. And what I was always been arguing is that the, the cost of a signal of always, and this comes from, uh, I mean, won't go into it all, but it's Maynard Smith and Harper, the, great theorists on all, on all of this stuff. The, 
the, the, the cost of communication, the cost of emitting a signal are of two kinds. One's the, um, the, the strategic costs, that's how much energy and time and effort has to be put into the signal to convince the listener they mean it. And one's the efficacy cost, which is just how much energy do you have to get to make sure that the signal is transmitted. So you can, above all the noise, all the rustling of the forest or whatever else is going on, the listener can pick up whether, was that a p or a b? Were they saying pin or bin? That's almost nothing. Now, to have a digital system, the strategic costs, the costs of p proving that you mean it, have to be reduced to zero. And when the listener only needs to perceive what the signal is, is it a p or a b? Was that a nasalized or unnasalized consonant? Was voicing on or off? Then you've got your on off signals, and those make all the difference. Now, if you have to generate the trust on the hoof each time you signal, you're never going to get to digital signaling. To get to digital signaling, the trust has to be there already. You have to be in a trusting community. People, so that's so trusting that even if you say something which is patently false, they'll pick up this false signal, you said something nonsensical, and they hear it, and they know you, and they know you're not a liar. What is that nonsensical, evidently false signal intended to convey, and we call that metaphor, don't we? When we say something which is clearly wrong, okay, it's wrong, it's false, metaphors are always false, but there's a truth, an intended truth there to be perceived, but you have to have a lot of trust in order to perceive it. Well, Cedric Books, I'm so pleased, <laughs> he's saying that's the solution to the whole problem of where does digital signaling come from. It doesn't come from having a digital computer in our heads, it comes from developing a social structures where the trust was already there and then within the group you don't have to make all that effort to prove anything because you, you know the trust has always been uh, already been constructed by other other methods now my own view is that mojo would be the start of everything Jerem just described it once there is i mean what the women are doing when they're mim mimicking that um it's kind of ridiculous behavior it, traditionally it used to be called mimesis so the idea was is a merlin donald various other people, they've said that language began as acting. So language began before you had words and grammar, humans in the course of evolution began to be good actors. So whereas our distant ancestors, you know, they would, they would, they would convey through sobs, tears, cries, screams, like real authentic bodily expressions, meanings, humans began to be capable of faking their sobs. So, uh, so, or faking other things, uh, and, and the one of the examples is, okay, here's, and they usually have John and Mary in these <laughs> linguistic textbooks. So, Mary sees that John is about to eat a poisonous mushroom, and she wants to warn him. And she goes, <coughs> you know, as if she's spitting out a poisonous mushroom. And John sees Mary spitting out, she knows she's not really spitting out, but he's, oh, she must be telling me something. You see? So, her fake is accepted by the listener as intended, and then the intention is understood as long as, of course, she doesn't think or he doesn't think that, that each one's trying to trick the other. I mean, cl clearly, if she says, don't eat that because really she wants to eat it because it's perfectly, perfectly edible, that would be the kind of trickery which would stop any of that dynamic from, from evolving. So I was supposed to cut a long story short. Um, it was only when, th I mean, I, well, all right. That idea of mimesis was good that language or proto-language, as they used to call it. I, th I think some people still do call it proto-language. There's an intermediate stage between primate hoots and calls uh, and language, and it's called mimesis, which is, of course, pantomime, vocal as well as gestural pantomime, faking. But what was never adequately explained was, OK, but how was it that humans in the course of evolution would be able to fake their sobs, cries, and other authentic expressions, become good actors, when, other, when chimps you think, well, why don't chimps fake things in order to help each other? And uh, primatologists would say, and this would be, say, Michael Thomas said, would say, well, because they, they're not that interested in helping each other. I mean, obviously, mothers and their own babies would be helping, and relationships are formed. But right across our whole community, there's, there's not this drive to always be helpful. There's always something else going on. So fa somebody who started to fake, we've already discussed this, through this thing called mimesis, wouldn't be rewarded by it. They'd be ost ostracized for, you know, for, for acting, for faking. Majo explains that because the story of Majo is already mimesis. Those ladies are pretending, they're repeating something which happened yesterday, having a great laugh about it, 
it's already in mimesis, but we now have a contact for mimesis which we didn't have before. And the context is, of course, kind of becoming human. I think Jerome put it just beautifully just now. It's like what the women don't want is any behaviour, by, particularly by males, which would be reminiscent of the kind of things male chimpanzees might do. Male chimpanzees can be a real nuisance. Of course, human males can be a real nuisance. We all know that. But what, how, does it, how, is that, how is that stopped? How is that prevented? And among hunter-gatherer, egalitarian hunter-gatherer uh, in general, women's collective laughter is, of course, a levelling, this, this is the sort of traditional way of putting it, a levelling device. Women succeed in using laughter as a way of preventing men. Men just don't like being laughed at, especially by a group of women, preventing men from misbehaving. Might do as a perfect example, except uh, it's a rather early example. I, I think Camilla would agree, and others might agree, that something like Mwajo would be very old, actually. would go right back to when the, that time when Sarah Hurdy discusses collective childcare. So, as every, anyone knows, she's read uh, an extraordinarily brilliant book by Sarah Hurdy, the great founder of sociobiology. She was the founder of sociobiology. She was the only one of the pantheon of, you know, founding fathers of sociobiology who knew anything about uh, primates and humans. Sarah Hurdy. She she um, d described how this f a form of cooperation, which is the most important f form of cooperation that drove us towards being fully human, was cooperation in childcare. And around that time, women would have had a sort of leverage using the, f the cooperation they formed for looking after each other's babies, being you know babysitting for each other. That would have given them a sort of leverage in order to help um, you know persuade males to be increasingly helpful over evolutionary time. So Mwajo would be quite a, an, a, an ancient thing, but it would, that would have culminated in something even more amazing. What the point, one of the things which um, Jerome might have gone on to talk about, and I just really briefly mention, is um, he, uh, Jerome was saying that women sing this polyphonic singing, and, and said to Jerome, "Why? Because he was like, why are you singing all night? We're singing for our lives." Um, and Jerome talked about these you know, saber-toothed cats and huge lions. The point about the lions, of course, is that they have fantastic nocturnal vision. Lions are quite lazy creatures. They like to eat you without making too much of an effort. And they can do that if you are foolish enough to be out at night after sunset when there's no moon in the sky. And there's a lovely series of graphs done by Craig Packer working in Tanzania looking at incidents of humans being eaten by lions. Um, there's a huge peak <laughs> just after full moon when people have been out partying the night before and then they're feeling quite relaxed. The sun goes down, there's no moon in the sky, it doesn't rise for 40 minutes. The lions are hungry because they don't like, you know, they, they get quite hungry during the period when, you know, when they can't hunt because they can be seen because the moon's out, so they, they, they pounce on you and there's a big peak in people being eaten. All I'm saying there is that this pulse of female getting together, forming coalitions, singing for their lives, safety in numbers, would have been a monthly pulse. There would have been particular intensity of singing once a month around the, t the time of Dark Moon. Um, and, and, and so you get this, p this pulse and it cl climax, we won't go into all of this stuff, we've talked about it in other lectures, but really a, 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 a revolution. So this Mwajo rebellion against bad behaviour turned into a, a full-on revolution against primate-style behaviour. But again, just to say one more thing, as Mona Finnegan points out in a lot of things she's, she's written, you wouldn't have just had a revolution and then, okay, we've got egalitarianism, uh, or sit back now, that's fine. Um, what would have happened would be women would have done their mwajo, it would have been more like Ngoku, this full-on female <laughs> rebellion, than mwajo. Mwajo would be connected with, with Ngoku, but Ngoku would be the sort of consummation of all that. And then once women have taken power, in the, in the evolutionary past, there's no evidence that women ever seized power from men and then s felt, okay, now we've got the power and kept it. Is if that, if that, that, that hilarity, laughter involved in, sh in shaming men and you know, proving that women are you know, strong and defiant, if that was enjoyable, women would have wanted to do it not just once. So instead of just like one event called a human revolution fading into the distant past as just a memory, if it's that much fun overthrowing the men, why not keep on doing it? And there's only one way of making sure you can keep on doing it, is to take power and then surrender it. Let go. But only risk 
surrendering it and letting go if you know next dark moon we'll be get back you know we'll be back uh, and you know repeating it so you get this pendulum of power between the between I, in my own view something like what Jerem's described as Nigoku versus the Jengi the men the women have to take power then they surrender for, you know they get sort of you know they've done enough they made their point you get a bit of normal life for a while and then the men strut their stuff but the women don't want the men to outstay their welcome and so <laughs> they collapse and they get this pendulum which is common which uh, Mona calls communism in motion um, my own view is that that's how we became human and then the last thing to say is that during the period of the ritual action in ritual everyone is of one mind ritual joins minds together you don't need language people don't need to think I wonder what you're thinking you're all in the same ritual but as the rituals collapse on a regular basis everyone f dissolves back into being relatively individualistic as real people in space and time then you might be interested in what others are thinking and then what you do you use abbreviated fragments of the gestures and songs and dances used in your ritual to communicate ideas and we've got both the ritual and the language uh, and they support each other and we've have you solved the problem <laughs> we hope so but of course there are all kinds of questions and um, But just for the benefit of everyone listening, um, you know, this is a subject of a book with, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of, well, it's, it's gone through various versions, but it's, uh, it's at least 400 pages. <laughs> so uh, there's an awful lot that we have omitted and we've compressed in this uh, presentation. But the idea is just to give you a, a flavor of the, the structure of the argument and, and where it's coming from and how it's uh, developed. The other thing to mention is to say that Oh, sorry, that uh, Cedric Books is coming to RAG. We're bringing him from Barcelona to talk, and his title is Hunter Gatherers of Words. Um, so he's going to kind of put the whole mega picture together. <laughs> and, uh, and we're a bit in awe of him because he is a super um, star <coughs> lingu linguist, a uh, proper linguist. But he's taking in all this material on hunter gatherers, the archaeology of the pigment record, and, and so on. So he's really kind of wanting to make this kind of big integrated interdisciplinary effort on this big problem this super problem of of the origins of language so um we want to hear march the 5th he's doing that so yeah put it in your diaries um we're very interested to hear it um so we have a few uh can i we, we've got people up here so we'll just do we'll the chat um people in the room Questions, if you'd like. And I, the part where you said that um, basically the, the inception of language is kind of the creation of this symbolic layer, remind me a lot of psychoanalysis and Zach Lacan. And I think one of his ideas is also that the creation of language is also that, that initiation of um, the symbolic, but also in the sense of desire, in the sense of lack. Like, who are you who are referring to? Jacques Lacan, the French economist. Oh, Jacques Lacan, all oh, right, yeah. Did you explore that through his theories? So, the can you repeat the question, the question here? Is, are we at all influenced by Jacques Lacan? I think and the answer is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> should we be? Should they be? Um, should they be? Um, I, we, there is a good question from Mark on Zoom that maybe does need addressing. Um, and Mark is making the point, Machiavellian intelligence theory, uh, research on tactical deception, that's the Burn, White and Tactical Deception database, has suggested that, um, I think it's vervet, they think vervet monkeys can make fake predator calls, possibly capuchins, possibly chimps and baboons can do fake predator calls. Um, maybe getting better food or sex while others uh, are distracted. So um, can you address that? There's also birds called drongos who do this. Tactical deception. Yes, the, the issue is, of course, um, as long as the tactical deceptions of vervet monkeys or baboons are relatively rare, um, they can work. There's no doubt about it. So I remember learning about this you know, decades ago. Um, there was some little baboon um, who's been 
pestered by an adolescent baboon and made to you know cry basically and um the the, the victim's mother was getting fed up with this and uh, she and a whole lot of other um, female baboons started chasing the the miscreant who um who um, scampered off and then suddenly did something absolutely amazing it suddenly st uh, stood up erect and looked at the horizon as if oh my god i can i've seen a leopard um and everyone stopped to see where the leopard was and it was a trick and the and the uh, <laughs> the, the miscreant escaped and there are plenty of other examples of um, what's called tactical deception. It certainly works. The critical thing is, do the victims of deception appreciate the deceptions? Do they like deceptions? Do they reward them, enjoy them, when they've noticed that they are, in fact, false signals? Because you need to get to that to have anything remotely like language. In language, everything's a deception, but we like these deceptions because they through these deceptions, through these fakes, we learn about each other's communicative intentions. You know, the parts of what we're thinking that we want others to know about. We use some some deception. So to get to language or symbolism, we need techno we need these deceptions to be frequent, um, and yet still, despite being frequent, socially acceptable currency. And that's what you will not find in these um, primate um, examples. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any Any in the in the room? Dominic. Nice to see you. Do, you guys need to keep here because you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sir. You, well, yeah. We'll repeat the question for Zoom. Oh, sure. Oh. Yeah. Um, two brief comments on the question. So my first comment is, um, so I'm English, so from Europe. I'm guessing most people are here, but. Um, Jerome and Chris's points about cooperation and language, which came first, it seems to be a problem. That's, I think that's not well known in Europe, but I did once or twice go to the USA, and in the USA that issue is well known by a name which I learned. It's called the Aporia. So just in case that's of help to people. Um, so Camilla, I think you've got a background in the um, classics. You can mm -hmm. help people with that. I might have pronounced it wrong. I probably, uh, yeah, I can't, uh, I'm, yeah, uh, I, yeah, you better. I mean, it's, it's like, like a, a contradiction. It's like a paradox, isn't it? But... So my, my second comment mm -hmm. is, you mentioned Chomsky and the ray that comes in. Cosmic. So I, I absolutely agree with you. That seems um, a kind of ludicrous idea. On the other hand, I think it's kind of honesty from, in a sense, from Chomsky, because I think, so my department, I'm at master's level, I don't have a PhD, but my department was in computer science, and I would say that most of my friends and colleagues in computer science, their idea of evolution um, is basically the same as what you put in a kind of comedy form from Chomsky. So the more that you can establish that that's um, not a helpful idea, of, a helpful way of looking at evolution, the better. Right. Do, do you want to repeat a little for Zoom? Take, take, well, it, repeat it, for Zoom. It, sorry, for everyone on Zoom. So Dominic has mentioned that he comes from a computing background and that among his colleagues, the idea that a mutation could generate some, some novelty, novelty like, like a language organ is accepted as standard and perfectly, you know, res like, you know respectable. And I, instead of making fun of it, me and Jerome should take it a little bit more seriously and develop perhaps a more serious argument against it. Is that right? I um, think you're right. Yeah, okay. But perhaps you okay. I mean, I just, how widespread it is. Well, it might be widespread, but it's, I mean, Darwinism doesn't work on the basis of mutations suddenly doing things. The mutations are a background, and what matters is which mutations confer fitness. So yes. fitness is reproductive success, and you get and the idea is in Darwinism, you get very small mutations happening all the time, and those which confer fitness, in other words, in, you know, increase the reproduction of the bearer of those particular 
genes with their mutations. You know, if there's more offspring, then of course those <laughs> those mutations will be have a you know bigger representation in the gene pool at a later stage. Um, I just need to add to what Jerome said. I mean, the, Ch Ch Chomsky says that language is, although it's biology, it's it's not a, it's not biology as we know it. And he says that in biology, things like that happen, like adaptations, like the backbone, the ears, the eyes, they're always like compromises between conflicting um, selection pressures. So the backbone is not perfect, the human backbone, but actually nothing is perfect. The idea of a perfect thing, like a snowflake, is, is just not what biologists expect. So Chomsky says language is perfect. It's, it's a perfect design for computing. There's the design properties you'd expect in a perfect computer. And, and he also says it doesn't have any precursors. It didn't evolve from something. Uh, and some ape man, he calls him Prometheus. And he has many versions of this, not just as a one-off joke, by the way. He's, whenever he's been asked about the evolution of language, and I should perhaps have said it was, it was as a response to me and Jim Herford and others developing Evolang and putting some pressure on Chomsky to come up with a theory to explain this perfect object, he then had to come up with a theory. And as Jerome said, his theory was some kind of ape man was wandering around um, when there was a, a supernova explosion in some other galaxy, perhaps, you know, it's just it's a story. And, it, and it, as a result of the cosmic rays, it, 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 his word is installed. So it installed a perfect language organ in this individual's head, whereupon this individual began talking to um, itself. And um, I, I don't know, it's just like, I, I can't think of any Darwinian, any person who has any knowledge about human evolution, who would give that even the time of day. Um, but so if it's taken seriously in your department, good luck to you all. <laughs> what more am I supposed to say? I mean, it's just, it is completely... Is it the, satisfying? Is it, it satisfying? And the point is that once, that, um, so once he's decided that language is this perfect object, I can see why he can't have a Darwinian explanation, because there's nothing like that is going to evolve in an ape. So he has to come up with it emerged from nothing. And of course, don't forget that his real model is actual computers. He was in an electronics lab designing computational ways of you know, command and control of missiles. And if it's a, if it is a, I, mean, I should add a few more things. He, he, he says, of course, that this, this language organ had inside it concepts like carburetor um, uh, and bureaucrat all, from the moment the Homo sapiens emerged. It was already had inside it all the meanings of all these words. I mean, it's it's kind of nonsense, but he, I, to me, I, as far as I can see, Chomsky was forced into it because he wasn't going to give way on his primary commitment, which is that linguistics has to be a natural science um, and not a social science. So, if we could, Because if it was social, it'd have to be political, and he didn't want to be political. He wanted to be political with his, wearing his other hat, his, his activist hat, not with his science hat. So he had to amputate from language anything social, including even the idea that language is for talking to people even the idea that you've got a listener. He said sounds like aren't important. Languages would it would be would follow his what his thinking if all languages were inaudible. So I'm just saying to me it's all very interesting um that it's um I, I don't know, I don't want to say it's kind of nonsense. Can I add just a, a quick reply to your points? Okay. Um so you know that the movie two thousand and one by Stanley Kubrick. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my point is very brief. That's based on a short story by Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah. In the short story, exactly as you described, there's a ray. Mm -hmm. But Kubrick couldn't accept that as a as an artist, so he deleted that from the movie. That's why I'm saying what Trotsky says is science fiction at best. Yeah. Science. But I mean, if you just look at the ways, if you take any other species and you try and understand its evolution, you don't look at male behavior. You look at female behavior, or at least the childbearing gender of that particular species, because that's what determines the strategies that the males then have to employ in order to ensure that they are able to procreate with the females, given that it's a male-female dichotomy in mammals and primates, for instance. So um, what, you know, one of the great weaknesses of so many of the arguments 
um, by people like Chomsky and Steven Pinker and uh, Tomasello, they're all based on male prerog prer prerogatives. So one of the very common one is that warfare is what led us to become human. This idea of, you know, you've got to circle the wagons and protect yourself or your territory from the, the others. Um, but it completely ignores female motivations. And until you have a str uh, an explanation which incorporates the most important gender, females, uh, you haven't got any explanation at all, really. Um, and that's why I think our, our, our approach is much more uh, respectable and, and likely because we are looking at particularly female motivations. And it's the females who have to bear the burdens of these extremely costly children, as uh, Camilla's work uh, so admirably shows. So I think that that's another very important point uh, to yes. resist uh, these male dominated, rather patriarchal uh, explanations. Yes. <laughs> Um, brilliant. And uh, yeah, it's just worth popping in there about um, the differences between bonobos and chimps in terms of relationships with neighboring groups, which have been coming out just recently in science papers that whereas chimps have these very bounded territories where the closest they come to actually controlling their vocalizations is to silence their vocalizations to be able to patrol against an enemy. Um, whereas bonobos go and just go and make friends with total strangers. They're, they're shown now to be uh, absolutely extraordinary in their ability to exchange with complete strangers. Well, above all, for the evolution of language, you need cooperation between strangers. That That is fundamental oh. to uh, the basics of language. Um, Dasha, are you there? Can you say something about your question on the animal signaling and trust? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I just need some clarification on the how you're using those terms, uh, trust, and then also language. <laughs> so trust, it seems to me, is just embedded in the natural world. The animals assume that, and your example of the human call to the diker um, coming out, you know, they're showing trust, they, and they keep they have a basic trust and so it seems like humans have to develop distrust and they're much better at you know uh at doing that that's one issue so if you could clarify that the other is the nonverbal communication animals are doing this all the time too my husband and i do this too uh where you know it's uh hmm? the intonation is is uh conveying meaning uh, and I just wondered where the line is here, because uh, so I'm kind of advocating for animal, animal senses, uh, trust and language. Well, there's no, there's no doubt that, um, yeah, I mean, trust, some kind of trust is necessary for any kind of communication. But the, the dikers don't know that the, <laughs> the call made by Jerome or his colleagues in the hunt, they don't know that it's fake. The point about humans is we, we trust in patent fakes. We know perfectly well that the word dog doesn't, you know, piss up lampposts and wag its tail and all those things. We know that all these things are fakes. And we know that metaphors are like false statements and all those things. So we, we're aware that these things are not true. But we, in despite that, we look for the, the honest intention behind these, if you like, untruths. That's what's that's what's so astonishing. So we have we our trust is so great that even when we're told what looks like a complete lie, we, if it's if it's somebody we know, somebody in our community, we can't believe they'll be lying to us. We think, oh, this sounds like a lie. Let's work it out. Oh, it's a metaphor. Okay, so that's the difference. And and on the issue of animal, you know, body language and so on. I mean, yes, of course. I, I mean, there's no question that animals and it, trees talk to each other. I know that. And animals talk to each other all the time. It's incredible. Jerome's talking about it in, in, his, in his, when he talks about the sounds of the forest. There's all this communication going on. All we're saying is it's not language as linguists would understand. It hasn't got this digital structure. It hasn't got this grammatical structure. And however intelligent and loving and caring a chimpanzee female might be, Imagine, I don't know, imagine a chimpanzee female has had a dream about a banana, say, lots of bananas perhaps. Um, you know, when she wakes up, it's not just that she she doesn't know how to or she can't explain all these dream bananas to anybody else. It's like, the question is this, would anyone else care? I mean, would the other chimps be really interested in dream bananas? <laughs> I think they would be interested in bananas, but not dream bananas. I mean, the point about we humans is we're, we're fascinated by what's in each other's minds. 
not just what's going on in the world. Body language tells us how, sort of what, how we're feeling, how tired we are, all this, whether we're a male or female, all those things. And animals do that in incredibly sophisticated ways. We still haven't worked out, and we're only just beginning to understand the extraordinary depths of communication subtleties between all the different turtles and various creatures that sometimes were thought not to even have to make sounds. It's just that language is different. And, you know, and it's puzzling. And it is, it has this, aspect of digital structure. Not everything in language is digital, of course not, but it has an aspect of digital structure. Chomsky is not completely wrong. He calls language digital infinity. With a few digits, you can produce combinatorially an infinite number of possible sentences. So every time I say something or you say something, probably the first time in the entire history of the universe that particular sentence was uttered. Astonishing creativity. So it's still a puzzle, um, Dasha. So and I, it's, no one's trying to belittle what animals do. It's just that animals, humans do all those things, actually. We do have a body language and we do this extra different special thing. I don't think, I don't think language is better than what animals do. It's different. Um, and it still needs to be explained because it is remarkable. One of the things Cedric Brooks um, points out in the article that I mentioned earlier on, he says, language is to the human as the trunk is to the elephant or the long neck is to the giraffe, or the huge hind legs are to the jumping kangaroo. Language is sort of, I mean, it's just a particular thing that marks humans out, and it surely needs to be explained within a scientific framework. It's just that natural science, as opposed to social science, cannot get there. If you try natural science, you end up with, a, with this miraculous, you know, cosmic shower and mutation, and that's as far as you're going to get. <clears throat> Any more in the room? Nick? Yeah, I, this is the third week in a row I've been, and so I want to sort of come link it to what Chris String, String, Stringer was talking about in one question, maybe. Yeah. I've got time, a quick question about Chomsky as well. So Chris Stringer's talking about uh, the evolution of humans mm -hmm. in terms of uh, our biology and so on. Uh, you were talking about where the evolution of language fits into that. I find what you're saying utterly convincing. It's a very powerful, robust argument, I think. Uh, but you are pushing back this evolution uh, of the uh, things that make humans unique uh, uh, quite a, a long way, aren't you? Because uh, if we're talking about the evolution of our vocal cords not being linked to language specifically, but to singing, to uh, being able to mimic different creatures and so on. So it's part of our, uh, it assists humans in terms of social interaction going back for hundreds of thousands of years, because presumably Neanderthals, I think, had the same vocal equipment. Yeah, Neanderthals speak, had. I'm sure. So uh, the common ancestor of Neanderthals, 700,000 years, and us would have presumably had the same vocal equip, equip. So this, so this is going back a long way, isn't it? It's not, and it, you, the human revolution that sort of completes that uh, biologically or that social evolution could be relatively recent, but you still think that precedes the actual development of language as we know it now. Is, so that creates the absolute environment, social environment of uh, trust between human beings and cooperation, which then allows and that uh, symbolism, full on symbolism, and and therefore full on language as you understand it now. Just that's uh, one quest question in terms <laughs> of uh, it's a. Can, we big uh, can I can yeah. I just Perhaps say that, that to Zoom? So you're. Saying we, we assume that in common ancestry of us Denisovans and Neanderthals, there is a shared um, vocal tract and vocal structures, auditory as well. Although there are significant interesting differences actually in auditory, um, we assume that, and that could go back almost a million years. And um, but we're talking about a social revolution really closer in time, which would link to in civilization, link to the evidence, archaeological evidence of the Oka record. Okay, that's a question. Well, in civilization, presumably it happened 700,000 years ago, so it's the joint ancestor of us and the Anglophones and the Lisbon. Well, there's We've a bit played. of it, but, but yes. there's more recent encephalization that would be linked to our speciation and the Anglophone speciation. Okay, in so it's a bit common. I'm, I'm just wondering what's the question in there? 
<laughs> we're, we're saying it's a social revolution subsequently and that we could have really independent... It. It's developed from what Chris originally wrote in Blood Relations, say, where you've got oh, yeah, a that's a long time ago. 60,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, from then later. That's way no, so, But now you, the origins of this human revolution are going back hundreds yeah. of thousands of years, which is fine, and it makes perfect sense. No, I'd say it's three to five hundred would be the so, origins, and like combination of 160 something like that in the second stage of species well, singing and uh, singing could be going and taking yeah. the piss out of people all day. i think my joke could be, could be going, going back, back to long. homo erectus yeah. so you, i mean the, so the, i think the point is that it's if sarah Hard, Hardy's work is really the, yeah. the key thing is yeah. when you know women started to group together to look after their children to support one another grandmothers menopause um uh, the white sclera um, as opposed to dark sclera, um, those are the probably the key markers. And you know, if perhaps with genetics, you know, sort of analysis, it may be possible to look at the phylogeny of those uh, particular characteristics, and then we could fix a much clearer date to these processes. But right now, uh, you know, knowledge is evolving all the time, and so where Chris might have thought whatever it was, sixty thousand years before. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, now with the knowledge that we're acquiring, it's much more likely to be what Camilla just suggested, you know, 1.2, 1.5 million years ago, when these early women started to group together, perhaps singing for their lives, um, the, the ear canal and the vocal cords of our uh, homo antecessor, or whatever that means, um, uh, antecessor, yeah. antecessor um, would have been, <clears throat> you know, someone who'd already got these things developed so you know how much we can read into that is is very difficult to say at the stage of knowledge we have but clearly this is something which isn't a flash in the pan a cosmic ray it's a very slow process over millions of years that evolved into what we are today um and and that in itself i think you know makes it more plausible yeah that's a very quick thing on the tongue and lips and so on i mean i've read really very i mean Klaus Zuberbühl is a really brilliant primatologist, um, field primatologist and theoretician about all this, and all sorts of wonderful stuff on, on you know, complex signalling um, among among monkeys, and 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 and, and, and yet I, there's a, a passage in one of his articles where he talks about how, um, in order to develop what we are capable of with speech, um, we need to overcome the the inflexible tongue of primates. And I just remember thinking, I mean, it, it's like, how can you have the problem of an inflexible tongue? How can a, how can a chimpanzee or actually anything about any animal, if you had an inflexible tongue, how do you swallow food? How do you taste it? Just to me, the whole idea that there's some sort of defects like inflexible tongues and sort of stiff lips and various things. <laughs> the point is the reason why chimpanzees don't use the tongue when they're signaling is precisely because the tongue is flexible. You can manipulate it, you can put it up, down, make different sounds, and the lips as well. It's, it's not because these things are inflexible, it's because they are flexible that they don't get used in costly signaling. So I'm just saying, you know, you need, you need in order to be, make, I mean, what happens is, when we speak, we're kind of eating while while we're, while phonating. We're making a sound while kind of eating. When we speak, you know, we're using all the apparatus which evolved not for communicating, but for eating. Tongue, lips, jaws, up, um, all that stuff. Whereas chimps are either, sp either are vocalizing or they're eating, one or the other. Um, and all I'm saying is that you needed this extraordinary degree of biologically unprecedented trust, trust to the point where you even trust somebody that's kind of lying to you and thinking it can't really be a lie, it must be a metaphor, in order to be able to use the tongue. The reason why chimps shut down the tongue is because it's not because it's inflexible, it's because it's too flexible. So I just, all that stuff about vocal apparatus is largely misguided in my view. I mean, actually, and take him, say, Fitch has pointed out, that he says that if you take a lion, a lion ought to be able to talk it's got all the right apparatus. It does, but it doesn't. I talk. think there's been yeah. recent papers saying the vocal tract for chimps is really the same. I mean, yeah, we've got an ancestry tract. which is a shared vocal tract. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And quite recent. Is it, was there another question you wanted to add, Nick? You said. Well, I just want to say, well, probably not got time to answer this. It's not really a question to you about <laughs> Chomsky and his idea about uh, uh, 
the uh, uh, language machine or module or computer evolves once like that. Mm. That's basically because he doesn't want to engage with biology or Darwin. He's just got this theory. He doesn't yeah. really want to explain it. But is he ever questioned about the vocal tract and all that? Because it, it wouldn't, uh, you would, he says you don't need the vocal tract language because uh, it's just used to speak to yourself in your own head. And it's only mm -hmm. subsequently as a byproduct of that that it becomes yeah. useful for language. Uh, then uh, he's not explaining the evolution of anything else, is he? He's not interested in the, the evolution base. No. That's just an observation. Right, thank you. Um, is there anybody on Zoom with a burning question or anyone in the room? Because otherwise we should a question wrap. Oh, right, go. Well, I find the Wacho scenario very convincing. But given the rest of your theory, you know, which is about sex strikes and that sort of I thought maybe negotiation might be might have come up more in the you know strikes end with a negotiation, you know, we want this amount of meat. Um you know, so <laughs> it's gonna be a bit difficult. Hunter Gower's like, not very calculating. You know, was there a, I just think would that have been sort of amongst the early discussions in the in the <laughs> Well, one way. Of yeah, okay, hang on a minute. We've got to do this properly. Come, come closer. Um, so the question was uh, for saying yes, Mwajo sounds very convincing, but considering the theory, Chris's theory of sex strike, wouldn't meat come under discussion and negotiation about meat be critical? Do you want to? Either of you, both of you. <laughs> um, well, when you think of what language is for, what it was originally used for, it was used for everything. I mean, you know, I mean, just think of all the uses of language. There's no limit to it, really. Um, but I mean, all right. Um, yeah, uh, sex strike. I should. First metaphor, isn't it? Yes. Talking about it well, I was going to say. I was going to say. We have Jerome and I have two possible titles for our book. Um, one of them is um, When Eve Laughed, with the subtitle The Origin of Language. And the other one, which my daughter and various other people are sort of angling for, is um, uh, the first word was no, and it was spoken by women. Um, and that's just because wajo is a kind of no. It's a sort of saying we're not prepared to put up with, and we are going to laugh at bad behavior by males. And um, the, the economic institution that's getting to your point about sex and meat of, of hunter-gatherers, the, the word for it is bride service. Hunter-gatherers don't go in for weddings, really. They don't go in for till death to us part. They, they have very powerful rituals, but they're not weddings. They tend to be initiation rituals, and initiation binds people as more like as blood. You, 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 you have your blood solidarity even as you become uh, you know, sexually mature, you, you've got to know your duties to your to your kin. Um, so now what happens then is that you can't you can't work out how bride service could work. In other words, bride service just means that men have got to make themselves useful. They've got to be helpful, go and hunt meat, bring it back. And they, if they don't make themselves useful, you know, just go back to mum and then, you know, find someone else to, to you know, <laughs> irritate. So... So as soon as you have the idea of bride service, it, 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 it implies intrinsically that women can say no. Women have, if you like, freedom of sex, your choice. My, I call it sex strike because it's just like a way of explaining where the solidarity comes from. If you're saying, if, everyone, if everyone's saying no, somehow you can't have exceptions. You can't let some people over there be saying, yes, you can have sex with me. That's going to undermine you. So there's a like, kind of logic of strike. But if, you, if some people don't like the word sex strike because it sounds too much like politics, like trade unions, so let's use the word bride service. But the no is there anyway. And of course, absolutely right. There's going to be a negotiation there. But I have a feeling that language isn't the primary thing that you use in those sorts of negotiations. I don't really quite see why it's going to need to be very verbal. I mean, men just got to get them. It's no good saying to men, if they want sex, oh, not tonight, darling, in some sort of coded language. I mean, men are quite big things. They're quite, and they can be quite you know, unpleasant and get violent and all that stuff. You've got to use some quite powerful, costly, collective signal. We think that laughter was there, but of course, you know... You what know, was the world's first metaphor? What were they laughing at? Well, okay, I mean, right. The world's first metaphor... I mean, the, the way to say no with body language is fairly clear. You just need to work it out. What's the sig How does a chimpanzee female signal yes? 
with her body. She says, right, to the male, I'm the same species as you, because the male wants, doesn't want to have sex with some other species, so I'm a chimpanzee. Um, I'm the opposite sex to you, I'm a female, and I'm in my fertile period with a huge big sexual swelling. That's what the chimpanzee does. So what's no? Let me just work it out. So what we, we make a prediction. Okay, this is an incredibly risky prediction because it could easily be proved wrong. We're saying the world's first metaphor was wrong sex, wrong species, wrong time. Okay, so in other words, women need to turn into animals, elan bulls in Australia, maybe kangaroos, anywhere, animals, male animals at that and bleeding. And then, okay, that's a prediction. It could be wrong, very unlikely to be right, isn't it? Look at the rock art, look at the myths, and you'll find, actually, surprisingly, rituals, rituals as well. Early rock art isn't about mummy, daddy, and the children. There's not a single element of cave art or rock art anywhere where it has mummy, daddy, and the kids, the nuclear family. It's always something to do with animals, which are sort of partly humans, bison, woman, and various other animals, and they're bleeding, and they're sacred, and they're divine. And, uh, you know, the, the predictions of that theoretical model they should be easy to test, easy for any of you here to disprove. Try it. Try and disprove it. Look at the actual data, the rituals, the rock art, the, the mythology. You'll find the fairy tales, the myths, the rock art are all about animals, magical animals, flitting between human and animal form, lots of blood, sacred blood. Need I go on? <laughs> <laughs> Does Jerome want to say fine, anything fine, there? Fine, I, th I think we're going to need to see that Leanne's going off to Birmingham by night. Um, oh, uh, quickly, because we've got to wrap up. The second part of the theory, where does it come from? And where could we read more about it? I might have missed it in the talk. Sorry? The second part, there seems to be a very important pillar of the theory and book. The faking it part. The where faking, does it come okay. From and where yeah. can we read about it? Okay. Um, well, there's, there's an article, there's the Wild Voices. There's an article that Jerem and I published in 2017 called Wild Voices. Ah. There's an article by me, I can't remember what the year was, it's called Honest Fakes. Uh, isn't it? It's right? two, isn't it 2008? 2008. That one, okay, Wild Voices. So It'll be on Chris's research that, gate. Okay, so the, the critical point there is that the most people don't think of symbols as fakes. They think of them as the conventional definition of a symbol. It's a conventional association between a sound and a meaning. And that's all very well. It's a bit boring. And it doesn't, it, the, the reason I don't like that is because it doesn't engage with evolutionary theory and it doesn't engage with what other animals do. I'm saying by chimpanzee standards, everything that humans do, whether we use symbols, is false, fake, not real. And it's difficult to work out how something which is clearly fake can still be of interest. I mean, when I, mean, I was asking, answering Dasha's question, she was saying, you know, don't these, you know, and other people have been saying, that don't, you know, don't, don't vervet monkeys fake. There's all kinds of deception goes on in the animal world, but do the, do the different animals appreciate one another's lies? Do they appreciate one another's fictions? That's the point about humans. We appreciate each other's fictions. We call it metaphor. Metaphor is the, Secret of language, it's a generative principle. All the different part, all the different elements of grammar, the past tense part endings and future tense, all the over, <laughs> they're all metaphors which have been used so often that we've forgotten the art of metaphors and they've, they've, you know, they've been abbreviated, they've turned into funny little things, little bits of beginnings and ends of words. Metaphor is where it's at. By the way, Chomsky can't stand metaphor. He doesn't like metaphor. He says it's a, a metaphor is a deviant expression, you know. And of course, if you're, if you're typing on a keyboard, trying to get a missile to go in the right direction, you don't want to be metaphorical. You don't want to type in something on the keyboard and actually you mean something else. The computer needs to actually have it literally spelled out. Humans are never like that. We never live, almost never do we spell things out in that way. Everything we say as we speak is, you know, sort of saying one thing and meaning another, and we trust each other. And we, that's a, that's why language is so strange and creative. So, but, but yes, Lawrence, I mean, uh, maybe we haven't emphasized that enough. What I'm delighted about is that Cedric Books, Cedric Books, by the, he's the, he's the author of Minimalism for Beginners, the Oxford Handbook of Min Minimalism, minim a whole range of Chomsky and textbooks on sy syntax. And he, what he appreciates most of all in the stuff I've been doing, is this new definition of a symbol. It's a fake. It's a patent fake, it's an obvious fake, and we love them. An honest fake. An honest fake, yeah. Um.
I think we've got to uh, pull this together at the final and, and um, end now because we're, we're running quite late. We've have been here at it for a couple of hours. Um, so I want to say thank you to everybody for joining on Zoom. It, it was um, very uh, nice to have a, a good Zoom audience. And um, just to say, next week is our last one before Christmas, and we are going to have a winter solstice fairy tale. Um, so Chris has made the claim here that fairy tales are carrying these signals, these wrong sex, wrong species, wrong time signals, all the way from kind of hunter-gatherer origins. And we've got a very matriarchal fairy tale, the shoes that will dance to pieces, so that will be a bit of sort of pantomime. I don't know if Chris is going to dress up this time, but it'll be a bit of pantomime activity with the fairy tale. So I hope um, you can join us again next week. And then I'll give you more information um, soon about next term again. And we're going to have Cedric Bokes coming to speak to us. So we're very um, thrilled about that in March, March 5th. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm going to say goodbye to everybody on Zoom and then goodbye to everybody here in the room. So thanks very much for joining us on Zoom. And for those of you, goodbye. OK. And um, thanks for your thanks to the speakers. And uh, everybody here, we can, um, anybody who'd like to come for a drink, I don't know if Jerome can join us as well. We, we go to the Tavistock, which is just round the corner at the bottom of Tavistock Square. For, they have very expensive drinks there, but um, it's quite a nice, quiet space to, to have discussions. So please do. Okay, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.